my name is Martha Hipley. I'm a designer and developer and artist, and I also write and teach about art and technology. In this talk, I'm going to dig into some exercises and ideas about using color when designing visual experiences that will hopefully give you some information and inspiration that you can use hands-on in your creative practice. I've worked in both extremely commercial software spaces and much more radical creative spaces. And at both ends of that spectrum, I see color choices that feel like an afterthought rather than an intention. Color is a really powerful tool, and with thoughtful use you can improve both the expressive quality of your work and the accessibility. I find it particularly common that artists working with generative art and engineers primarily concerned with getting the functionality right on a product tend to get a bit befuddled by color and rely on things like random palette generators online. Color is definitely a bit mysterious, but there's a way to grok it a bit better and use it to your advantage. So a quick exercise that I recommend you try if you haven't already is to put your phone in grayscale mode for at least a few days. These days our phones are the primary interface for most of us. It might even be the first and last thing you look at every day, not to get too black mirror on you. And if you are someone who wants to spend less time on your phone, I will bet you that if you have your phone in grayscale mode for a week, your screen time is going to drop significantly, but you're also going to notice how critical color is to most designs you encounter on your phone. If you look at this example of my own home screen, those little red bubbles for my notifications are almost invisible once that color is removed. Another big shock that I find is Instagram. Most photos and ads on Instagram suddenly look extremely muddy and unappealing once you take out that color. They're just not designed for anything other than hue. And I'm not a big social media person these days, but my favorite mobile game, Polytopia, is basically unplayable without color. I have no idea what's going on with the screen. I can't tell who's my army and who's not. And I always find myself, even when I'm trying to use grayscale mode, switching back just for this game. So color theory is a big, messy field that encompasses a lot of philosophy and science but I want to just give us a little bit of a basic grounding and some vocabulary that we can use both uh, for ourselves to articulate our own work, but also for working with clients or colleagues. So the basic properties of color are hue, chroma, and value. Hue is what you're probably thinking about when you're talking about color. That's those color names, red, yellow, blue, whatever. That's usually where most conversations about color stop. Chroma, also known as saturation, or strength, purity, or intensity, is, well, it's that intensity of color. If you want to think about it in an analog sense, if you were painting, the chroma would be how much pigment you have in your painting medium. So if you're painting with watercolors, you would have a transparent painting medium to hold the pigment, and if you wanted a higher chroma of red, you'd put more of that pigment powder into that medium. Value is going to be the lightness or darkness of the color. And again, if you were painting, this would be how much white or black paint you had mixed in with that red to try and lighten or darken it. Something that's a bit tricky to wrestle with is that in practice, these properties don't operate independently. In our example of mixing red paint, if I'm adding white paint to that red, I'm increasing the lightness, but I'm also reducing the chroma because now I've diluted that amount of red pigment versus the other elements that are in the paint. So I want to touch on human vision a bit. Uh, the human eye has two types of photoreceptors. There's cones that are sensitive to color. It's always easy to remember because cones and color both start with C and rods that are sensitive to intensity. So this is like if you have a poor night vision, it's because you're missing some rods. Now, of the cones, there's three kinds. One that's sensitive to red light, one that's sensitive to green, and one that's sensitive to blue. And these different wavelengths are perceived as these different colors. I would like to point out before going go on our next slide, that as you can see, that green receptor is covering a wavelength that's quite similar to that red receptor. Now, this is important when we talk about colorblindness because the most common form of colorblindness, deuteronomaly, is a reduced sensitivity to that green light that makes it difficult to distinguish between those green and red frequencies. 
There's also protonomaly, which is a reduced sensitivity to red light, and tritonomaly, which is a reduced sensitivity to blue light. These other two types are much more rare, but still worth accounting for if you're planning on designing for an audience. Now I want to talk through some color models. So RYB is a subtractive mixing model. This is probably what you're used to. If you learned a color wheel in primary school, this was probably it. The primary colors are red, blue, and yellow. All those colors to added together, in theory, makes a near black. If you ever tried to mix all those colors together in primary school, it probably didn't work. You probably got a really nasty shade of brown. But conceptually, adding them together would create a near black. To have the purest color, you would want to put that on a pure white ground. And I also want to note here that primary colors as a concept exist in part because of the availability and cost of pigments when these models were designed. So today if you go into any old art shop, you can get a box of paints that's going to maybe have 10 or 12 different colors, but the chemicals and minerals and organic materials used to make these colors used to be quite expensive and exclusive. So artists would be trained to mix three primary colors to get a broader range of color rather than trying to start out with that full spectrum. It's not something that's necessary today because these pigments are all much more accessible, but it's a good way to kind of come to an understanding of color by having to work through these relationships. Now CMYK is another subtractive mixing model. This is pigment-based color for physical surfaces. These are called subtractive models because even though we're adding pigments together, light is being subtracted when we combine those pigments. So we're getting less light into our eyes when we're adding these pigments together. It's a little confusing, but color theory. It's a, little, it's a lot confusing. So in this case, our primary colors are going to be magenta, yellow, and cyan, plus usually a black to achieve that real pure black. And it's going to be represented in digital spaces as a mix of four values for each property. So CMYK0000 is white. And this is a model that's important to know because this is what we're thinking of in terms of traditional printmaking and printing. You might recognize this as the colors of ink cartridges that you need to buy for your inkjet printer. Or you maybe have had to put a document into CMYK mode before you send it off to a print shop. It's important to kind of understand that how these colors work together because if you ever have to design anything for print, this is going to be really important. Now, RGB is an additive mixing model. And this is color for screens and digital interfaces. So color is being transmitted via admitted light rather than by light being reflected off of pigment. And our primary colors are green, red, and blue. All of these colors added together gives us white, which is why it's an additive model. And the absence of light is going to be that true black. So this second image on this page is a zoomed in view of TV pixels, where you can see that each pixel is actually three points of light, these three colors. And it's the combination of these points that's going to give us the different colors on a screen. This is represented in digital space as a mix of three values for each color, so RGB, 255, 255, 255 is white because we're maxing out all of those three points of light and getting that pure white. Now I also want to throw in HSL or HSV. This is an alternate version of RGB. It's another version of color for screens and digital interfaces. And this is an attempt to make computer graphics more closely aligned with human perception. It does not 100% accurately separate colors by their properties. It does not 100% replicate what we talked about earlier in terms of hue, chroma, and value, but it's a bit closer and it can be quite useful if you're trying to create effects in a digital experience that are replicating that human vision. In digital space, it's gonna be represented as a mix of three values for each property. So for example, HSL00100 is white, because we have no hue, we have no saturation, and then we have lightness maxed out. Now 
I want to talk particularly about some of the technology in these electronic displays and projections. Basically, the historical rundown is we started with CRT, or cathode ray tubes. If you are as old as me, maybe you grew up with one of those big, thick TVs that went about one or two feet deep. It would probably weighed a ton. It's because it was full of these cathode ray tubes. These have been displaced by plasma screens, LCDs, LEDs, and OLEDs. This is our classic flat screen. Your computer monitor is going to be probably a plasma or LCD screen. If you have a Game Boy, that's an LED screen. These have gotten incredibly cheap in recent years, um, and they're, the color quality is definitely better than your CRT TV. Now, the path of all of these technologies is that they are extremely expensive to start and then rapidly de decrease in price. Um, a gag I like to think of is, let's see if it will load. Is a particular episode of the American Office in which Steve Carell is extremely proud of his extremely expensive plasma TV, which he probably spent more on that in the concept of the sitcom that I spent on my big giant plasma screen TV I have in my living room today. I want to note that that doesn't mean that they're 100% accessible. Um, for example, I'm from the US, which is a really privileged position to be in in terms of electronics. You have a lot of purchasing power, but also the US has different trade relationships in terms of where these devices are manufactured and how they cost. Um, an anecdote that really illustrates this is that the last time I bought a laptop, it was cheaper for me to fly from Mexico to New York to buy a laptop in New York than it was for me to buy that same computer in Mexico. So if you're designing experiences, you do want to keep in mind that you're probably designing for people who are not going to have necessarily the most top-of-the-line plasma screen TV. Another thing that's important to talk about is that because these are newer technologies, there's a lot of issues around display and preservation and ownership of these technologies. This is true in terms of contemporary art use cases, but it's also true in terms of commercial software. For example, there are a lot of major studio video games that are no longer playable because of copyright issues over the content, the lack of preservation of the original cartridges and CDs, and a lack of preservation of the platforms that play those materials. So again, if you're thinking about using these tools, the burden is probably going to be on you to preserve it and preserve that rich experience. So the last thing I want to touch on in terms of this science and history of color is the visible light, light spectrum and this concept of the color wheel. So the visible light spectrum does have this scientific basis and the wavelength of the light itself, but the color wheel is kind of an arbitrary concept. It's an attempt um, by various artists and philosophers and thinkers throughout history to try and express color harmonies in relationships that are pretty abstracted. Uh, the main reason that the rainbow has seven colors, the Ruiji Bib that you maybe learned in primary school, is because Newton thought it sounded nice because seven is a magic number and it would match the seven pure tones of music. It has nothing to do with the actual nature of visible light. It just sounds cute and it looks cute on a circle. So the first activity I want to give you that's a proper sort of color picking activity is using a pinhole to understand and analyze color in an object. So when I'm talking about using a pinhole, I'm talking about taking a piece of card or paper and literally just poking a hole in it with a pencil or pen. I like to use old cardboard from like food boxes. This is a popsicle box. The nice thing about these kind of boxes is that you're going to have kind of a, a mid-tone brown or gray because they're often made of recycled materials and it's actually better to be balancing your color off of a middle tone rather than a pure white. So once you have your pinhole, I want you to find an object or space, just something interesting visually, and use this pinhole to isolate colors in the object. So here I have my little succulent buddy from my desk and it's this brightly colored spice tin and 
I can use this pinhole, so I'm, I'm only looking at the yellow, I'm only looking at the green, I'm only looking at the blue. And I want you to use this sort of artificial isolation to design a color palette. After you've done that the hard way, by using your pinhole and making your palette using whatever tool works for you, maybe you want to make it in Illustrator, maybe you want to make it in Figma, maybe you want to just code it out in HTML, I want you to then take a photo of whatever you tried to isolate the colors on, so whatever object or space, and then I want you to use one of these online tools to generate a palette. Now as an example, I took a photo of my little succulent buddy and I made my own palette. And then I used Adobe's generator. So what's going on here? On a basic level, my eye is just working differently than a camera in terms of how it's perceiving light. And it's also working differently in term than whatever algorithm is averaging and prioritizing these colors. My brain is also understanding these colors differently once they've actually just been perceived by my rods and cones. Maybe I'm really drawn to the bright green of the succulent and I'm overemphasizing it because it stands out amidst all of this organic clutter on my desk. Maybe I'm drawn to it because on a very animal level, it represents something that might be appealing as food. Maybe I'm amping up the colors of the tin because I associate it with nostalgia and family memories of my hometown. There's a lot going on in terms of what my brain is thinking about this object, even when I'm going to the trouble of isolating these colors. Something that I found is that people have really strong associations with colors and will tend to extrapolate that out into meaning without even realizing it. So, for example, I had a client who really wanted to use a bright shade of yellow, and the yellow that she wanted to use wouldn't have worked for a lot of practical reasons with what we were working on. But I went to the trouble of interrogating what she liked about it. And what she liked about the color was that she had some packaging of a skincare product that had that color. Well, it's not just that the packaging looks cute. Maybe it's that the packaging represents a self-care moment for her. It represents a time to relax and treat herself. So even though she's just thinking, I think this package looks really cute, she's bringing a lot to the table that's shaping why she likes that color. Another example that I always find comical is many years ago I worked for Major League Baseball and we would work with a lot of different teams and one of the teams I worked with was the Washington Nationals. Now as part of the league-wide style guide, we would have certain types of graphics where you would need to use gradient. So we would take the team's primary color and fade it into white. Now this causes a problem when you're working with a sports team because I would constantly have members of the Nationals management telling me we can't use pink because it's too feminine. Well the problem is that if you're fading from red to white there's always going to be pink in the middle. This is just kind of a comical example of people get really have big feelings about color that are kind of irrational and kind of detached <laughs> from the actual reality of it but sometimes you just have to play with that and work through that. Now this type of color chart is quite common. You can find these online. This one's organized in a pretty arbitrary color wheel. Sometimes they're in just more of a bar chart. Um, people like to attach symbolism to colors. The first problem with this is that these kinds of charts are generally based on a very Western European viewpoint. So you can kind of toss them out for that alone. So for example, in this chart, they're saying that red is aggression, it's passion, it's maybe even violence. But in China, red is very classically symbolic of good fortune. It's used for New Year's, it's used for wedding dresses. You can't just take it for truth that red is aggression because of this chart when the world is full of a plethora of cultures that are interpreting these things differently. But these charts are also neglecting how color is just about context and composition in general. So isolating color in this way and trying to attach it directly to symbols is just kind of limiting your toolkit. One other example I have to this effect is this is an exercise I sometimes do with workshops where we start with a blank word cloud and we all take color dots to try and match a color to what we think of each concept. 
some of these concepts are more abstract than others. I'd say sour is probably one of the more consistent ones because people are just thinking of lemons and limes. Classy, pretty abstract. Every colored dot is different. And this is an exercise that I ran with a fairly homogenous audience. This was pretty much all people in Western Europe. And we still got a lot of different feedback on what these color mean, colors mean. So even if you think your audience is homogenized, it probably isn't in terms of how people are going to interpret color. So another exercise I have for you is one about random feelings. So I want you to pick a feeling or an abstract concept that you'd like to illustrate, for example, happiness, boredom, tiredness. And then I want you to use one of these online random generators to generate a palette. Whatever palette you're stuck with, I want you to try and create a composition using those colors in any amount, any shape, to try and illustrate what your concept was. And I've included the master of this, Mark Rothko, because, again, he's this master of making this happen in that way, of using just color fields to create real emotions. Now, to that effect, I did this exercise, and I took some, some uh, inspiration from Marth Roth Mark Rothko uh, from this quote, which is, if you are only moved by color relationships, then you miss the point. I'm interested in expressing the big emotions, tragedy, ecstasy, and doom. So I decided with my version of this, I'm going to try and express doom with this random palette. So what have I done? I've tried to use shape and balance to create something that feels maybe a bit ominous, a bit stressful, the way the world is on top of our poor little green dude. I'm trying to use more than just the colors themselves, but also these other properties of design to try and make something that can divorce itself from my stereotypical associations with these colors. If you're kind of feeling burned out, this is always a fun exercise to do, just to freshen up your thinking. Now next up I want to talk about addressing the basics of color accessibility. So my first tip is you want to plan your color strategy from the start. Color is not icing on the cake, color is part of the cake. So what do you want to express with your work? What colors feel right for that goal? Where are you going to be sharing your work? What platforms and devices will people use to see your work? Is the work really going to be purely digital? Or are there going to be aspects of it that are displayed on physical media? And who is, who is your intended audience? What kind of devices do they use? Where and when will they be experiencing your work? Um, I had a problem where I was working on a commercial product where we had been testing the app in the office on our iPhone seven, eight, nine. One of our clients had their assistant trying to use the platform on a cracked iPhone 4. It was a really different experience. It was something that we didn't account for until we actually went and talked to the person who was using it. To this effect, I want to talk about the life cycle of a digital work. We can get really myopic, no pun intended, about what we're making as digital creators. So say we're making a VR experience, we're probably focused on what people are going to see in that headset. But that work is going to be experienced in so many other ways. So for example, it might have a paired display at an exhibition. Maybe the gallery that's exhibiting it is going to make a social media post. Maybe we want like a poster to promote it. Maybe it's going to be included in a printed catalog or book. You might need to upload a screenshot of that work later for a grant application. Maybe you need to put in a PDF portfolio that you're sending out to a committee. Maybe you want to take a screenshot and put it on your online portfolio. Someone else is going to take a photo of that exhibition display and put it on their Instagram. There's a lot of ways that this work is going to be experienced. Some of them are totally out of your control and you can not optimize for everything, but you can save yourself some headaches by planning. So. Another sort of real-life example is I was working with a software brand who had chosen a really bright neon green. It's one of the brand colors. 
It was an online platform. It looked really cool on the web. And who cares? It's great. The problem was is that it was a company and employees needed business cards. They wanted to make swag to send to investors. They wanted to make posters for company events. And suddenly that green color was a problem. It's a color that can't be printed with a regular inkjet printer using the CMYK color model. The only way to get it printed was to send it to a print shop that could do serigraph printing and color match to Pantone's. It was ultimately cheaper and easier to change that brand color in the UI than to get print materials made in that green. So just keep that kind of thing in mind where something that feels really exciting but maybe non-essential for the digital version might make your life really complicated when it comes to a physical or analog manifestation of a project. So a, a rule you often hear about color accessibility is don't use color as the only way to express important information. I would revise that to say don't use hue as the only way to express important information. Again, I'm going to bring up Mark Rothko. We can simulate colorblind, red-green colorblindness on this image, and it still has a lot of the same power. That's because the color choices are not just about the hue, they're also about chroma, they're about lightness. He's making some distinct choices about this composition that are not just red versus yellow. The next rule that I think needs a little revision is make sure important elements are differentiated with contrast. I would change that to make sure your use of color, your use of contrast and composition serves your goals. So here's two works that I am particularly fond of. One is Hieronymus Bosch's The Garden of Earthly Delights. The other is Casey Kaufman's Hashtag That's a Spicy Meatball. Both of these works are about chaos. They're about a certain kind of hellishness. They're about confusion, disorientation. And we can, sim again, simulate that color vision, and we still get the same feeling. Maybe you want things to feel chaotic. Maybe you want things to feel confusing. Maybe you want to create friction. And to that effect, maybe you want to be aware of how little contrast you want to use. Again, always identify your goals and make sure the colors are serving those goals. Next up, I would say test your work early and often on as many types of hardware as possible. So ask friends and colleagues with different devices to help. If you're an iPhone person, you should have Android friends. I know that they give you the green bubble in chat, but it's important to have them when you want to test your work. If you have a budget, you can build your own library of devices for testing. I also just save my old devices for testing. I have an iPhone 5 in a drawer that I will pull out and charge to test things. You can also use device simulators to cover some edge cases, but it's never quite as good as just getting people to look at it on a device. Then I would add, test your work early and often on as many platforms as possible. Upload color studies to these platforms before you finalize your decision. So before you even make the thing, do your little color palette, your little color study, and post out on Instagram. You can delete it two minutes later, but you just want to see if it works once you upload it there, and it works at that scale. I would also say you want to check regularly for updates um, in terms of how these platforms are recommending that you give them images, and take the time to tailor your content for each platform suggested upload best practices. Don't just take one screenshot and just upload that to Instagram and Facebook and Twitter without doing anything to it. Some additional tricks and traps about social media. In my experience, red is a particularly difficult color for most compression algorithms. Just kind of always turns out nasty, especially the higher chroma the red is. It's going to have more artifacts. If you're using text in an image or a video, you want to err on the side of high contrast because you really want to avoid those artifacts with text because you don't want to affect legibility. And in a bind, I highly recommend having an app like VSCO on your phone. It's designed to make things look nice for Instagram, so you can take your screenshot and just run it through there, and it'll do some magic that'll help prevent those artifacts. VSCO's uh, color filters I find are particularly helpful 
for kind of getting stuff into that right Instagram space to avoid that nasty artifact edge. Rule number six, enhance your work with other tools to help express your intentions. So like I talked about before, you can use other formal elements, composition, line, shape, form, texture, pattern, to double up on what you're already expressing. I also highly recommend checking out Alt Texas Poetry. This is an initiative by Shannon Finnegan and Bojana Kolpiat to make alt text more creative and effective. It, has an, it includes a workbook for writing better alt text, and the methodology is something you can apply to all texts associated with your images. So if you're posting a screenshot of your VR project to Instagram, when you're writing that caption, maybe take a look at their workbook and write that caption with that kind of concept of poetry in mind. It should be something that enhances rather than something that just kind of substitutes for the image itself. Another activity that I like, um, there's this brainstorming game called synesthesia. It comes from the word synesthesia, which is this uh, tendency that some people have to mix up senses. It's a brainstorming game about exploring those senses. So it's basically telling you, you know, what would your art or design smell like if it had a smell? What would it sound like if it had a sound? The fun thing about working digitally is that maybe you integrate that sound into your design. Maybe you integrate that smell into your design and have some smell of vision. The possibilities are endless and it's worth using every option that you have to increase that experience for everyone. The last really valuable set of uh, resources I want to give you is resources for testing for colorblindness. There are a lot of free tools for testing your palettes and projects so there's not really any excuse for putting anything out into the world that's not going to serve people with different types of colorblindness. So Color Oracle, this is a free colorblindness simulator for Windows, Mac, and Linux. It's an app that you can put on your laptop, you can turn it on, and it'll turn everything into a simulation of those different types of color vision issues. This is great, particularly if you are using something like, say, Unity to develop a project, or maybe you're doing something in processing, and you don't want to have to take a screenshot or leave the app to be able to test for colorblindness. The colorblind web page filter is a pre free tool for simulating colorblindness on a web page. The accessible color palette builder, this is a palette builder that is specifically oriented around making sure that you have sufficient contrast for legibility. Contrast is a Figma plugin, so if you use Figma for your designs, just get this free plugin. You can check everything really easily. And then Coblis is a free image simulator for different types of colorblindness. So the simulate images in this presentation were made with Coblis. And then the last, last thing I want to leave you with is some recommended reading. Now, as was mentioned in one of the previous slides, color theory in general doesn't do a great job of addressing um, how color is perceived through different artistic mediums. And Joseph Albers is one of the few color theorists to actually approach that problem. Interaction of Color is a really essential book for anyone working with color, and it's full of all of these kinds of exercises, kind of like some of the ones we've got today, to help you think about and play with color and understand it a bit better. So if you want more hands-on stuff, this book is a must-have. The other book I'd like to recommend is Hawthorne on Painting. Uh, this is about using color first and using color as a compositional element. Again, rather than icing, it's the composition itself. And it has a lot of great advice for getting out of your perceptual habits with your work in general. I recommend it for creatives across the board, but I personally found it helpful for thinking about color as a critical formal element rather than a garnish in my own work. Well, thank you for your time. I hope some of these exercises are helpful and these resources are helpful. Um, and I always am a fan of giving you as much free stuff as possible, so definitely I recommend checking out all of those free tools around accessibility. They're there for you, and people want you to use them. All right, thank you.